<laughs> and then also, literally, work said to me, um, we're putting up. You know what, if you were a really mean person, you could fill those up with mustard, not tell anybody? Oh, I won't tell then. I gotta see this. Oh, how cool! Oh, my God. I will buy one. Yeah, so like I say, it, he does, we do the smell, because we use the, we use the second branch one. Um, we get chocolate kisses. So that's what you're playing. We're going to present the Hanukkah, the lighting of the candles, and explain it as we go. And we have Benita, who's going to be explaining the history. Why do we sell? Thank you. So you guys are all here for a reason, and it's a great story. <laughs> So on the way driving here, I started talking to my daughter and I asked her, why do we celebrate Hanukkah, do you know? And she goes, oh yeah, is it that 12 days of fasting? And I was like, what? Where did that come from? And what I realized, what was happening in her brain has been happening in my brain for quite some time. Julie had asked me around Sukkot if I would do this part of the presentation and share with everyone why we celebrate Hanukkah. And I love gathering information. We just learned at our own table something new tonight. <laughs> and the, the laughter comes when something is true. When we gather the information and we look at something and we discern and we struggle and we have those moments of opportunity where God shines a light for us, that we discover not only something about a ritual, a tradition, a history, but we start to discover something about ourselves. So let me tell you about how stories work. There's always a hero, right? <laughs> so if you go to our Bible and you look at the Bible as a whole story, from Genesis to Revelation, and I ask you, who's the hero? Yeah, it comes up quickly, right? But let me tell you a little bit about how we write stories in our contemporary way. We usually have someone that is seeking something, someone that wants to get somewhere, someone that has a goal and wants to fulfill something. That usually is our hero in a story, right? So if we think of our contemporary Star Wars or even Lord of the Rings or any other contemporary story out there, the hero is the one that goes through a journey. But the journey always comes with stumbling, with crashes, with tragedy, with torture. And in those moments of weakness, there's always a guide that shows up in a story. And that guide is the one that comes alongside the hero and reminds them who they are what their goal was, and what their purpose is. And that guide can be like Yoda, Gandalf, <laughs> you name it. Even in the toll booth, there's a guide, right, that comes along and helps our character to get to his destination. And so if we stop and look back at the Bible, is Yeshua the hero or the guide? And so that brings us to the Hanukkah story. And there's a ton of history in Hanukkah. Yes, it happened. It was a true story that there was a band of Torah believers that had been sent out into the hills escaping the Greeks. And they loved Adonai so much. And they wanted to preserve the Torah so much that they were willing to be tortured for their beliefs. And in their moment of weakness, strength, Adonai, spirit, everything came together at the right moment for them to come back into Jerusalem and take back the temple that had been desecrated. It had been, there was slaughtering of pigs on the altar. There was Hellenism. The men of the time try to uncircumcise themselves 
Ladies and gentlemen, I know what's going on in our world today, but when you read about them trying to refashion foreskins for themselves, they're trying to do something that's an abomination, not only to their culture, to their history, but to themselves. They didn't have a guide. They wanted to be like the Greeks. So they sought out that culture. They sought out to be a part of something that they weren't meant to be a part of. Come in, reclaim the temple. And they don't just clean the temple. They destroy the altar. They take everything out. And the only thing that was left, as the legend goes, is the one jar of oil to light the menorah. So they did. They did what Torah asked them, and they lit the menorah. And it takes seven days in order to get consecrated oil to fill up a menorah. So the story goes that that one vial of oil kept the light burning for all of the eight days. The one day was provided for and the seven additional days. So if we go back to talking to my daughter on the way here, we were talking about Sukkot. And that brings us into that story of what is Sukkot? That is the Moedim. That is asked of us by Adonai. And that is also that seven day of celebration plus the one eighth day that is most important. And for many of us that practice the Moedim, Julie got to travel even to Israel this year for Sukkot. We do it because our guide tells us to. And that's the Torah. Those are the laws we follow, the things that we want to incorporate into our life every day. And then we get the blessing of Yeshua for those of us that believe in his redemption. He becomes our guide in life, in love, in joy, in hardship, because the heroes are us. We're walking out our own stories, and in our own stories, we are our own heroes. But our guide is there to tell us what to do, what is right, what is wrong, what we need to stand firm on, what we need to be willing to die for. That's the importance of Hanukkah. Now, all the fun and joy that we get, we get to gather, we get to have parties, we get to eat lots of oily food, we get to celebrate with the menorahs because of the eight lights, but none of that is part of what's required of us. Because what's required of us in this season and in every day of our own personal stories is to turn towards Adonai and to let him write onto our hearts what we need to do each and every day. So as we take out the Hanukkah blessings, you'll see that at the top, it says rabbinical. And what rabbinical means is that our forefathers long, long ago, exactly one year after the reclaiming of the temple by the Maccabees, they lit a dedication light. And that dedication was for eight days, just like Solomon had dedicated the temple. And so when we say these blessings, these are the blessings that are recorded in a Talmud. And the Talmud is part of what the Jews use as their guide. Now, it's not exact and it's not perfect because man wrote most of those interpretations. And you'll notice even in our blessings tonight, we'll say the first blessing that has commanded us. But we're not commanded by Adonai to light the candles because Yeshua is our light. He lit the candle for us. So it's part of bringing things together and understanding the histories along with our own personal stories that we can truly make that circle in our own traditions, in our own homes, and how we choose to bring each and every one of these opportunities together into our lives. So with that, I would like to stand with Julie and start with the first blessing. And what we would like to do is share with you the lighting 
of the Hanukkah. What I just remember, and do I start right to left or left to right? Ah, there's an easy way that Messianics remember this. Does anyone know it? Okay, why do they candle that is required? Oh, interesting. So, yeah. Are you going to read the Hebrew? Or are you yeah, it's Hebrew. Hebrew. Oh, perfect. Okay. First with the first blessing, and the second for the second blessing, but on the first night, you have an extra paragraph to read. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments. Put it back in the middle. It burns right there. When I did this set in my house last year, then there were four, and then there's five already. Because <laughs> it is a beautiful thing. Now, do we blow these out? Yeah. yeah. And, and the thing four. And what happens is they want to persecute those who are standing up for what is righteous because they have it written on their heart. That they're being forced to eat pork to deny who they are. And as that persecution grows, that's as the strength grows in the, each and every one of those heroes that I was speaking of. And so as we light the lights, there's so much different traditions around it. But the point is, and why I believe after reading a lot, is it is true that it is mentioned in the apostolic writings in Luke 10 that Yeshua was in Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. And even though it's a Talmudic historical event that's recorded that has all of these different parts to it, he was still present. And I can't tell you if he lit eight lights or if he lit the one required by the Talmud that, had, that uses oil, and olive oil is specified as the best oil to use. But I do know that his heart was turning to the Father. And so whatever you guys choose to bring into your homes this season, I pray that it brings your heart closer to Adonai. Yes. Yeah, I was, as I stepped into the entire time. Yeah, we got bored. You built it just now? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Especially when you have We were just asking about my own heritage. And I was raised in New Mexico. And I was raised Catholic in a crypto Jew family. So my family did not speak of our Judaic ancestry at all. But I can see it come out. And I could see it when my grandma would always light one candle in the window during the month of December. I could see it when she would pray at sunset on Friday nights. And I could see it when she would only go to church and mass on Saturdays. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Julie. Happy birthday to you. I think this is a beautiful thing to do. So I appreciate all your explanation of everything and all your research on it. <laughs> she doesn't do anything unless she thoroughly researches something. That's right. So I appreciate your time in doing this and making it very special for us. You're welcome. Yes, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So now that we have concluded this, I do not blow out the candles. You let them burn all the way down. And I had a puddle of wax on my table <laughs> from everything because I didn't buy the, the candles that don't drip, the dripless candles before, but we do now. And I want to invite you all for two things. Number one, dessert. And number two, uh, after a few minutes, we're going to start the dreidel game and just have some fun with that for a few minutes. I say yes. we start the celebration. Oh, do you have a question? Um, Julie asked uh, Benita and I to do the speaking and Benita talked about her Catholic roots, and I actually am going to be touching a little bit on my Catholic roots as well. Um, and it's amazing how God orchestrates these evenings. So I also have a little story to tell. Um, I'm not as good as Benita, so I have my notes, though. <laughs> um, so it's a little story about a little toy with a big taste right? 
Um, imagine with me, if you will, it's the year 175 before the birth of Christ. Um, you're a young it governs every part of your life, what you wear, what you eat, when you work, when you rest, except now you can't even talk, your, ask your mom a question about it in the marketplace for fear of death. There's a resistance, though. People don't like the new king and his new laws. They gather in secret to study and to learn God's law. One day, you get to go with your older brother. When you get there, all you see is a bunch of kids playing with toys. One of the young men recognizes your brother, though, and he tells everyone, it's okay, it's okay. This is the guy I was telling you about. He's one of us. And then they tell you why they have the tops and the coins out. It's really simple. See, the study of our religion, it's illegal. And so we gather in secret. And if the Greeks raid us, if they come to find out why we're here, we're just playing games here. There's nothing to see. So no one really knows the origin of the dreidel. The four-sided top has been around for thousands of years. People have used it to, to play gambling games. Uh, what archaeologists believe is that the top did originate in the Middle East. It was spread by the Romans during their, their conquest of the world. Um, historically speaking, though, the dreidel didn't actually become part of the Hanukkah celebration until like the early 1500s after Christ. Um, so why does this all matter? Um, because there's another question you might want to ask yourself before you let your children play in this, and that is, do we want to be teaching our children to play gambling games? And that's kind of where I come in. Um, I was raised Catholic and was taught a lot of things that the Bible says that the Bible doesn't really say. Uh, the Catholic Church teaches it. It's called the Catechism. So when I started asking questions in my teens about why we do things in the Catholic Church, I was told that this is what the Catholic Church teaches. This is what the Catechism teaches. And that, wasn't, that answer wasn't good enough for me because I was one of the few people among my friends who actually read my Bible. And in Mark 7, verse 6, Yehushua, he says, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commands of men. So, it's been an interesting journey, and I've loved, it's been an interesting story, to borrow from Benita's talk, and it's been filled with struggles, and I've loved every moment of it. Um, so, I shied away from Hanukkah for a very long time when I started coming to Torah, because it's not in the Bible, and they teach their children to gamble as part of it. Well, in recent years, I've reevaluated Hanukkah and its historical and cultural significance to the people of Israel. And this year in particular, I reevaluated my stance on the dreidel. Julie asked in a meeting once uh, while we were planning this, uh, she was telling me the outline of everything, and I said, well, I like everything except the dreidel, basically, because I have a problem with it. You're not supposed to get, engage in games of chance. Well, I went to the Bible, of course, to back up my argument, and I looked for that phrase that had been drilled into my mind, that we shall not engage in games of chance. I couldn't find it anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere. I couldn't find anything that spoke against gambling in the Bible. So, there's lots of verses that talk about greed and talk about being aware of the love of money and the roots that get into our lives if we place a extreme value on money as opposed to other things. And I, I pondered on this. It's like, well, where, what is my stance on this then? And I realized it's a lot like alcohol in the Bible. We're warned against drunkenness. 
But there's no widespread prohibition against alcohol in the Bible. We're warned against greed, and we're warned against the love of money, but there's no prohibition in the Bible against games of chance. So that's where I've come to stand. So we can't let the love of money rule over our lives, but we can still play a little bit with our dice and our gradles. That's all. Further. Oh, okay. Uh, with the dreidel game, your um, your materials on your page. Uh, for us, um, you could have beans or small objects, pennies. But with us, we have lifesavers um, and kisses. Um, and you need to have <laughs> you need to have a dreidel too. The way you play, you if you ever forget, you can either have your paper or look at these posters I have all around the room. Um, um, first, um, each player would put um, um, one piece of gelt in the center to form the pot. Um, and then the players would take turns uh, spinning the dreidel. Um, the, um, when, um, if you spin the dreidel, whatever letter it lands on, is what is the instruction of what you would do. If, um, if a player runs out of gelt, um, she loses. And um, if she ends up with all the gelt, she wins. Um, and so with these signs, um, I didn't write them on the posters, so you would just have to look on these to see. Um, Paisley will so. This one's none, so if you get it, you do nothing. And this one's gimel. You take everything from the middle. And this one's hey. You take half of everything in the middle. And shin, shin, you put some in the middle. Noon, gimel, hey, shin. Um, um, it's a, just a yeah, <laughs> one thing, it's a little easier if... It's also easier for some people if you put it a little bit over the table. I haven't done this in a while, so if you put it a little bit over the table and then that spin it, that's 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 how you do it. Um, okay. Okay. So, would you like to go first? Sure. Okay. So she landed on a gimel. It's wasted. It is. <laughs> She landed on a gimel, so you take everything. Take everything. Everyone tosses one back in? Yes, everybody puts another one in. And then it goes to like pick. Close enough. Okay. Put something in there. If also, yeah, if you run out, just put another one in. No, if you run out, then you're good. You're out. My bad. 